All right, here we are starting off the brand new, fresh out of the box design in the Great Statesman series by uh, Mark Herman, and this one joined on by Joff Engelstein, uh, Versailles 1919. So this one has a uh, Churchill and Pericles, I believe, and I think this is the third edition. There could be another one. Uh, but this, of course, has to do with the end of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles, where uh, the, I'm mean, playing the four-player version, uh, you know, obviously unopposed. I thought about doing the solo, but uh, you can do that by yourself if you want. This will give you an idea if you don't have friends who like, uh, if you don't have friends, first of all, and if you don't have friends who like games like this. So uh, this will give you an idea, and this will be kind of like the, uh, this will be kind of like the playbook, honestly. Uh, a little more dry. Uh, because uh, having having run through it mostly once and read the playbook and everything, uh, I can tell this will be a lot of fun to play with uh, friends, who, especially friends who have good personalities. You know what I mean by that, contrasting uh, personalities that, you know, enjoy playing games like this. And if you had a group that was really had a lot of fun with Churchill, they're going to have a lot of fun with this too. So that will be a much different experience than the one you're going to see here. This is going to be a lot more dry in the sense that it's going to be probably, it's going to definitely be learning for me, but it'll be learning for you too as well. Um, learning that I'm not very good at games, learning very good that, uh, learning that I'm uh, probably not as well versed in the rules as I should be, though I will say that the complexity level on this is miles below where I thought it was going to be. Uh, playing Churchill, for me, who plays a lot of games, was was a little dense, but once I figured it out, I figured it out, and I love that game. Um, and it, but it was difficult to teach to other people, and the group that I played with really struggled. They, I think they would be a little bit better off if they played maybe two more times, but the, the curve on that one is pretty steep. This one is miles away from that, miles away. This is what you should start. If you're going to introduce someone to this series, start them on this one, because this is, I mean, it's so easy to understand. Uh, as far as how you play, how you play, the, me the mechanisms, uh, how you play is one of the simplest things you'll find. It reminds me of uh, uh, Tammany Hall. If you've ever played Tammany Hall, you can only do like one thing. You can place two cubes, you can place two meeples, you can place a meeple on a cube, or you can place two, me two cubes, I think. So this is similar to that, where you can only do a couple of things and sometimes they're limited. It's just a little bit extrapolated by um, the unrest and you know, demobilization, but really it, it's very light comparatively um, to other stuff. This isn't Monopoly, but it's definitely not where I thought it was going to be, which is not a complaint. It's just I, I got this yesterday and I'm doing this now. So usually I have to wait like a week to play and read and that sort of thing. Usually watch some videos, which there aren't any out as of the, po as of the recording of this, which is why I want to do this. So um, we'll go ahead and jump right in. It's the four sides. Uh, Vittorio Orlando, the prime, uh, the prime minister of Italy, uh, David Lord jo da David Lord Lloyd George, prime minister of the United Kingdom, uh, President Woodrow Wilson, and then uh, George Clemenceau, the prime minister of France. You can't quite see it here, but I have the cubes and everything set up. It's going to be the Italians first, then the British, then the Americans, and then the French. So you you can like decide your own. Uh, or I think you roll some dice, or you can. It doesn't really say. You pretty much do whatever you want um, to determine. And then of course there's the non-player faction, which is in all games of the Japanese. Now you can play with three players without Italy, which I thought about doing, but I actually quite liked playing with Italy before. They work a little bit differently because they're every every faction's a little bit different, slightly. So uh, they are just an interesting uh, group to have and. I try and play a little historical. So let's go ahead and break down what's going on. Uh, this is not going to be a rules explanation, by the way, but I'll give you some basics. Uh, on the region track over there, we have the five regions that we're going to be dealing with. Um, they're denoted on the cards as well. So on a card, you'll have the issue you're talking about. This one is Palestine. Under it is the region that it is specific to, which is the Middle East. There are five regions, and there's also two more regions, as far as I know which is league issues and reparations. So those are the areas you're going to be dealing with, but those two issues, those two regions are not displayed here because these are geographical. So the fists are unrest. The higher up they are, the more likely there is to be an uprising. Uprisings can unsettle issues that have already been resolved 
and then the powder kegs will move further and further to the right, which will cap the, uh, the way, this way these fists can go. So the more to the right it is, the more likely it is to have an unrest um, or an uprising. And then the further this moves, it can move to a maximum of here. It just caps it to where the fist can't go anymore this way. So it makes it uh, more likely. So just more tumultuous, basically, is what it is. This is the uh, happiness track. Everybody starts at 20 um, in the four-player game. Uh, if they ever get below 15, Italy or uh, Japan, they will not sign the treaty, which I'll get to in a minute. And then there's different colors here, you'll notice. This is capping the amount of military that you can have um, in each of these. So the lower down you get, the less military you'll have to demobilize or you'll be forced into a mutiny, which isn't good. Um, do, 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 do. This is the main display over here, what you'll be doing with most of the stuff on the table. You have one personality in the room, you know, that's there as an event card is what it's called, but it, they represent people. And then two issues that are physically on the table that are being debated. You can still work on the issues that are in the waiting room, of which there are three. And then there's also the other uh, personalities, event cards that will influence things. There's the event, this, the uh, issue discard, which in can be manipulated in certain ways. I'll get to that when we get to that. And the last thing are the strategy cards, which after the first un uprising happens, um, you uh, each of the sides will claim one of them. And I like, I didn't like it, then I did like it. Um, I think I like it now uh, because at the beginning of the game, you don't really know what to do. You don't really have a guide. Um, that was until I looked at these. So these give you like the one of the main driving factors of how you're going to win. Now, on the cards, there are points, victory points, so obviously that's nice. But there's also these other little uh, counters that you're going to put on the cards. Those will get you victory points based off of what strategy cards you chose. So you're not going to know which strategy card you're going to get until the first uprising, which could be you know 10 to 15 issues into the game. Uh, I think that's about where it was when I played. And then you might not even get the one you want because the person who's in last gets to pick first and so on and so forth. So you may really want one and then you've been gearing up towards that because you've, you've won three or four issues, maybe five, and you've been trying to aim for one. And the person in last sees that, has a couple on there, and then picks it up and now you're screwed. So this is, a, this is clever. I like this. It needed to be in here. It really did because without this, um, it's not nearly as good. So those are important. But I will tell you what they are once we get uh, onto here. So it's going to be the Italians first. And they have on the table, just to show you, we have uh, Mustafa Kemal, a Turk, I believe, but close. He's a Turkish revolutionary. Um, he, at the Whenever a issue is settled, whenever it's taken off the board, uh, this little event here at the bottom will happen, unless it says optional, in which case it can't happen. And this just increases the powder keg in the Middle East and then possibly could cause an uprising. So that's just something to keep in mind. The two issues on the table are both Middle East issues, um, which from what I've seen, there are a lot of event cards that deal with the Middle East, which makes sense because... Uh, that was obviously a very tumultuous area after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. So we have Constantinople first, or as one of them, they're not in a particular order. A six, which is big, you can resolve it as uh, being controlled by Greece, which will move the unrest in the Middle East up by one, the little fist over there. You can move it as a open city, which will give the British one of their uh, naval markers, which could, could be picked up for uh, victory points at the end. Um, and moves the Middle East by two, or you could give it to Turkey, which raises the Balkans, uh, uh, what do you call it, unrest. So that one's good for the points. The stuff on it is not as nearly as interesting as this one, which is Palestine in the Middle East, worth a four, which isn't nearly as high, but uh, we have a UK mandate, which gives the British an empire marker, which once again could be part of your strategy markers. I'll show that to you after I get done with this. Middle East put up by one. French mandate, French empire, makes the U.S. and the uh, U.K. unhappy, and the unrest goes up. You have independent, which gives them a self-determination marker, which typically I find that the U.S. likes, or at least the way I play. Historically, I think the U.S. liked that. 
and that's the way that I played. So uh, the U.S. kind of has an eye on that. And then the last one is uh, a Zionist state, which makes the uh, British happy, but really makes the unrest go up. So those are the options that you have. The players will also have an eye on the issues in the waiting room, because you can also put influence cubes on this. We have I won't go over them too much, because I'll do that when they get to the table. Uh, but you have Rhineland, uh, which is a six-pointer, European, uh, different options there that benefit the French or possibly the Italians. You have Tyrol, um, which is in eastern or western, I guess, western Austria. Um, and it's a five-pointer. The Italians would probably like to get a hold of that. And then you have Arabia, yet another Middle East issue. And collecting a lot of the issues from one region is dangerous because then whenever the unrest comes around, it's going to target you every time. And if that doesn't make sense, it will make sense. And then the two events um, down here. These aren't as important once they're here, but uh, you have uh, Jan Smuts and Stephen uh, Pichon, I believe. And then in the discard pile, you can pick this up, is uh, Fuma, which is in the Balkans. And the Italians uh, would also like to get this because it gives them the opportunity for one of their empire markers. So a lot there, but I'll break that down. Let's take a look at these strategy cards to see what we have on display and what the players may want to uh, be looking at. So 14 points, obviously that's Wilson's 14 point plan. And, uh, you know, this is one that they would not mind picking up. Uh, and so what it means is at the end of the game, you're going to get one uh, victory point or a star per each uh, marker that looks like this, which is German containment, anywhere on the board. So even if someone else resolves it, one per self-determination marker anywhere, three for each if, uh, like three if Japan signs the treaty, three if Italy signs the treaty, which is determined by their happiness and then two per league issue that you control. So the league issues haven't come up yet, but that means that controlling those becomes very important. So that's one the U.S. Uh, would like. And anyone can take it. It's not scripted. I mean, it, it literally is means just as much for anyone else to do that. I'm sure on the issue cards, some of the tokens may favor one side or another, so it may, like, the British picking this one might not be the best, as given what's on the cards. I don't know that. But I'm sure there's a small bias, but one that's not huge because then that would limit you too much. So we have revanchism, um, and there's a little a little blurb here, which is nice. So you get two victory points per military, which are these little discs, and those can be demobilized or gotten rid of um, during the game. So each one that you have that you have not demobilized or not been forced to demobilize is worth two each. So this one's going to be much more aggressive, much more military. You get one per... Uh, little empire marker of any that you have, or sorry, that anyone has. That's this one for anything. So that's good. And this one is per British naval marker anywhere. And you want the Italians and the Japanese to sign the treaty. So uh, off the top of my head, the British would like that one. And that Obviously, because it has their thing on it, but there's a couple other ones that would like it. Mobilization, one per industrial marker, one per German reparations marker, one per uh, empire marker, one per military marker you have left over. So that one is going to resolve, be involved resolving a lot of issues. Um, I think the French chose that one last time. Isolationism, and this is one that makes it very interesting because this one has a no on the treaty for. Uh, the Italians and the Japanese. So that's what makes it really fun is is that one side will be, or multiple sides, will be really trying to get the uh, the Italians and the Japanese to sign the treaty, and then the other ones will be trying to get them not to sign the treaty. Well, when I played last time, the Italians didn't want to sign the treaty, so they were purposely knocking their own happiness down. So that can be kind of an interesting aspect. But this one also has a self-determination industrial, and then you get a times two bonus to your happiness. So whatever your happiness is, you'll double it at the end. So that one's pretty nice. I don't know who will want that, but... And then we have outlawing war. This is the last available one. You get one per uh, German containment, 
two per uh, Bolshevik containment, one per self-determination, and then one per region that has less than three uh, unrest, which is the last one I had in the last game was uh, you get one per region that has more than four unrest. Well, this one is lower than three. So basically all that is is you want the you want unrest to be low um, rather than high. You, we want the situation globally to be pretty uh, uh, calm rather than a lot of unrest. So that is how things will start off. And as I've said, there really is not much that you can do, there's some thinking involved in it, but the actual decisions over uh, you know, what route to take is limited um, and not in a bad way. So the Italians are gonna go first. They have three options that they have to do and two options they can do. They can place cubes, they can settle an issue, which they actually can't do, and they can reclaim influence or military from exhausted, which goes over there. You'll, you'll get it, you'll catch on to all of that. I'm not here to, you know, go over it, just, but you'll get it when it happens, um, which they can do. So they have to place cubes on issues. Um, so just taking a look at it, Constantinople's nice, six-pointer, like that. Um, Palestine, there's nothing really there for them, but they could resolve it as independent, get that self-determination marker, and kind of cast an eye towards one of the issues over there, one of the strategies. So like uh, isolationism might be good, Outlawing war might even as well. So both of these aren't bad. They like this uh, Constantinople one. But the one that really favors them is Tyrol up here that gives uh, the Italians some, uh, makes them not happy if it's resolved a certain way. Now, the Italians haven't decided if they want to be happy or not because they may actually not want to sign the treaty, in which case they want to win that and resolve it as Austria getting Tyrol. So, um, that's the thing is, even if you're not going to help yourself, sometimes you may hurt, you know, hurting yourself is kind of abstract in this game, but you may want to make yourself, your, the public at home, less happy, domestic happiness, um, go down, you, you know, so there's some options. So I think what the Italians are going to do, you start off with 15 cubes, you can kind of see them here at the bottom, 15, you can place as many as you want on a uh, exactly two issues, exactly two. And the thing is, you have to have the most when you do it. Now, obviously, the Italians are going to have the most when they do it because they're going to be the only ones, but something to keep in mind. So they can place as many as they want, and they only have 15, and it'll take, it, it's a little bit difficult to get them back um, somewhat. So they're going to drop uh, four, I think, because they're feeling frisky. They're going to drop four on Constantinople. They want to come out of the gates getting this big issue. Um which means that they might go last picking the strategy cards. So you know what, they're gonna go, they're gonna drop three. Still, still a bit because there's none they had to get. And then they're gonna put two on Tyrol. So you can put them on any of the issues that are either in the waiting room or on the table. That's it, that's all they do. Now they can place a military uh, cylinder thing. One of these represents a military force. They can place one of these on the uh, region track, which has varying effects or they could demobilize it, which would give them a happiness bonus, which they do not yet know if they want to do that, so they're gonna refrain. So they're gonna end their turn. It's gonna go over to Lloyd George and the British, who examine it and see that Palestine looks good, because there's a couple of different options there that they can go with, and Arabia looks good. Um, they like those two. So they're going to drop cubes on those. They're going to kind of follow the Italian model. They're going to drop three because they kind of, they, they want that pretty good. And then they're going to drop two in Arabia. Do the same thing that the, uh, that the Italians did. They are not going to do anything else. So now it'll go over to the Americans and uh, President Wilson. So Wilson examines and uh, there actually isn't anything on the board that affects them. Um, no... Uh, immediate. Well, there is one in the Middle East, excuse me. They could uh, lose a happiness because of the French mandate. And they're going to they're gonna try and get that 14 points strategy card. So that's going to be one per German containment, um, which there is one for Tyrol. Um, they're going to get uh, one per self-determination marker, 
which is on this Palestine here. There's also one on Arabia, one on Tyrol. Um, so that's interesting. They want the Italians to sign the treaty, so they uh, don't want to piss them off. And then two per league issue that they control. So that's what they're going to go for. They, now they can't take it yet, but that's what they're going to kind of keep an eye towards. So with that in mind, they're going to, you know, kind of like this. Could go for this and try and do the... Uh, the self-determination marker there, but I have a feeling that the British um, kind of want that one. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to drop three on Arabia. Now remember, whenever you place them, you have to place more than anyone else, not combined, just more than anyone else. So in order to place there, they have to place three. And then they're also going to do the same in Tyrol. Because there, they're happy either way. If it goes to Italy, that's okay. And there's leverage here. Uh, we'll get to that, but it's kind of difficult to actually resolve or settle any of these issues because most of the time you're not doing what you want to do. The things that you want done are often done by other people. So it's this fun tension that I imagine opposed would be a lot of fun. So they don't really care whether this gets done by Austria or by Italy. In fact, they would probably rather it get done by Italy because that keeps Italy happy. But they're going to fight for that issue and try and sway the Italians one way or another because they're not even sure if the Italians want to sign the treaty or not. So uh, they're going to try and influence them one way or another. Um, but it's not the end of the world regardless of what happens. So that brings us over to Clemenceau and the French. And they look at the board and see uh, that the Italians are, first of all, the Italians are coming up next. So they have the opportunity to resolve an issue. And what that means is, is that they can't, or settle an issue, I should use the right terminology. They can settle this issue, which they will win it because they have the most. You can only settle issues that are on the table. So that's kind of like a gimme if they don't do anything about Constantinople. They'll just take it, they'll resolve it however they want. Their cubes will go away, but they're going to get basically to have gotten Constantinople for free. So the French kind of want to stop them from doing that. But looking at the rest of the board, they also see Palestine. That's a, a French mandate there would be nice. Arabia, a French mandate there would be nice. And then Rhineland, um, they would like that one as well. So there's a little bit more to do than they particularly would like. So I think they're going to give up on Palestine, kind of like the Americans did. Clemenceau doesn't see the, the, the worth in that one, being it's only a four. Um, so they've got eyes on Arabia and on the Rhineland as well as Constantinople. So they're going to, in the hopes of uh, getting some negotiating power out of this, they're going to place the uh, they're going to place four, which they have to place more than remember on Constantinople. Then they would like Arabia, but there's already two people fighting over that one, so they're going to drop two on the Rhineland. And uh, that's another big six. So they're going to, to do that uh, because there are, you know, mobilization kind of looks nice to them. Uh, maybe isolationism, I haven't really decided. But uh, those two are their priorities. So now we're going to be back around to the Italians. Um, and I, I guess I'll, I don't really know how I'm going to structure this all yet just because it's pretty free flowing. So I may do the Italians and then just kind of do once around, you know, go around the table once and then just explain what happened uh, because there's not really turns. And so this game is much more free flowing. This, this game, uh, I think, succeeds in the areas um, of negotiation and table discussion, which obviously is not going to be the same. I know I've talked around this table for 24 minutes, but uh, it's much more enjoyable when there's other people involved in the discussion, I'm sure. So I'll figure out the exact uh, format, but I think I'm going to tell you what the Italians are thinking here because they may settle an issue. So now they don't have control over Constantinople anymore, or the, that issue, because the uh, the French have outnumbered them there. Now what they could do is they could settle this issue, this issue and then try and extract something from the French. Um, so... They could bring down another issue or, you know, something along those lines. But there's nothing really out there that looks that interesting. Now, I will say that whoever controls these uh, issues is going to have um, a bit of a difficult time because this card right here is going to move that powder keg in the Middle East up one, which is going to move the unrest up one, which means that it might not be very long 
before we are already dealing with an uprising in the Middle East, in which case this issue might become unsettled and become available once again for someone to deal with, for someone to take. So I think the Italians look at this as a long-term investment. Uh, the only problem is, is that the person that has the most issues is the one in that region, is the one that's going to have to unsettle one of their issues, which will be the highest valued issue. Um, the Italians went through this with disarmament um, in the last game. They were constantly fighting over that, which was really annoying. Um, so they understand how annoying it can be. So they may settle this on behalf of the French and say, you know, I'll settle this, but you have to settle it as Greece takes it, which will knock the Middle East up by one. Now, uh, let's just say they offer that. The French, if they accept, is binding because it's on the same turn. So if it's happening on this turn, you can't go back. It's a binding agreement. So they kind of see that's the Middle East. This is going to push the Middle East up as well. So they're going to be facing the possibility of already losing that. They also are looking at it as, well, if the British take Palestine on their turn, then they'll have an issue. And then the Americans might take Arabia, in which case all three of them will have one issue, and that makes the likelihood that the French have to give up their issue in case of an uprising even less. So I think that they see this as, yes, they might have to fight back over it again, but they're willing to have that fight if they do, and uh, they might not even have to have the fight at all. So they're going to accept that offer from the Italians. So the Italians, uh, Orlando is going to uh, resolve this issue, which when you resolve it, when you are not controlling it, you get all of your cubes back to your available supply. Normally they're going to go into the exhausted box over there, which means that you don't have them available. But now the Italians are locked and loaded for the next turn. The French are going to lose all of theirs. All of theirs go into this box over here. Anyone that did not win, but also did not resolve it, did not uh, was not the active player, um, will get half of theirs back. So there's advantages to resolving something. So the, the French, Clemenceau is going to get this issue, Constantinople, and he is going to have to honor his agreement to do uh, resolve it for the Greeks. Because he was, he was cool with either of these. He didn't want to do this one. But he, he was going to do either of these, so he's going to go with Greece. And that's going to push up the Middle East unrest by one. So that's step one. The Italians um, are going to do the rest pretty much. And step two is to resolve this issue which says add one powdered keg to the Middle East, then check for uprising there. So they're going to resolve this by pushing up the powdered keg and then resolving a, or doing an uprising check there. Now there cannot be an uprising check because if you notice, there is an X under this column or this, uh, yeah, this column. So it's not possible. There's not a possibility of an uprising on these first two. So there cannot be an uprising, so that card is basically ignored. And now they get to pick one of these three issues in the waiting room to come down. And I'll kind of zoom in on this half of the board. Um, so the Italians obviously see Tyrol as an option because they, uh, you know, have cubes on it. But if it gets around to the Americans, you know, the British are going to resolve Palestine, and then the Americans can just resolve that. So they're not crazy about it. So they may bring down Arabia instead um, so that the British can fight over that. But I don't think they are. I think they're going to bring down instead the Rhineland. And they're going to do that because they want the uh, Middle East issues not to be won by somebody else. They want the French to have the most Middle East issues when unrest happens. So they're hoping to get the unrest in the Middle East up enough to unsettle this issue and get it back on the table where they can fight for it again. So they're going to bring down the Rhineland instead, which they're assuming someone is going to try and fight over, because the Americans aren't going to have something to fight over if it stays like this. So they'll probably go for the Rhineland, kind of force somebody into keeping the French from having 12 victory points. Uh, they're also going to pick one of these to come down, and they're going to move down Jan Smuts 
uh, have him down here, this event will happen the next time. They could place an influence marker on it, um, which is kind of interesting. I think they'll drop one on there. So if you have an influence cube on the card, you get to decide how it's resolved regardless who resolves it. Um, and now they can decide what they do about uh, these issues up here. So they can either draw two cards, pick one, put the other in the discard pile, or they can choose one of the cards in the discard. So normally it costs you influence to dig further down. You can dig all the way down to the third card from the top, but there's only one. And they actually quite like this one because it gives them the ability of an empire marker. So they're actually gonna drop this right in as their choice, which they quite like. So uh, all in all, not bad for the Italians. That's going to be a lot of what's going on. Very rarely, from my experience, are you actually going to be resolving the issues that you control. It's going to end up falling on somebody else to do it for you. So now it's going to go over to Lloyd George and the British, um, who are going to resolve Palestine, almost certainly. I'll go ahead and do this. I thought about pausing, but they're going to resolve Palestine. Now there are no conditions on this because no one has uh, any leverage over them. Now other players could petition and say, hey, do this instead of that, or, you know, I think this is actually in your best interest to make it a Zionist state, you can bump your happiness up, um, which this is where it gets fun here because look at this. The, uh, the British are, are gonna be kind of on the edge here because they could resolve it as a Zionist state, which will give them happiness but it'll also bump the Middle East unrest up by three to the five column, which means a four or greater, four or greater roll will, uh, and you know what, before we do any of this, I'm gonna go back to the Italians quickly because we haven't done anything, so I haven't messed anything up. I'm gonna go back to the Italians and the Italians are going to drop a yellow, uh, they're gonna drop one of their military pieces here on this track. Um, this isn't exactly what they want to do, but it, you'll understand why they want to do it in a second. So they are going to put, more, they're going to deploy a military piece, which is another option. They may do a military action, which is demobilize or deploy. Demobilizing removes it from the game. Deploying puts it into one of the regions. So they're deploying troops to the Middle East, um, which will have an effect on the uprisings and that sort of thing where they can kind of influence. So they're going to put it, um, they can put it in any of these four columns. The further left you place it, the more influential or more, the, you know, I don't want to say powerful, but the better it is. The, uh, there's a word for it, I believe. Um, but the, the better it is, usually the left, the most advanced it is, the more advanced it is to the left, typically uh, the, more, the more powerful, the stronger position they're in. That also means the penalties are worse. So if you have it in this far left column, you lose four happiness. So that's obviously not great. So in that column, they only lose one. So let's back it out. They're gonna lose one happiness for that. And they get to recover two of their cubes from the exhausted, which there are none. Now that gives them the ability to toss in that military in case an issue becomes unrest, it becomes unsettled in the Middle East. So then they can bid that influence, that uh, military piece and get a bonus. Normally each one of these you toss in as a bid is worth one. Ones that are deployed in that region are worth two. So uh, I meant to do this before the British took their turn, which is why I went back. And they also have a sway over the die roll modifiers in that region. So they can either make it more difficult or more easy for a uh, uprising to happen. So. With that said, we're going to go back to uh, back to Lloyd George and this one. So he's going to resolve this issue or settle this issue. So these are going to go into the exhausted. Bye bye. And now they have to decide. So what they're looking at is one of their flags, one of their empire flags, which is good. Or they could get this British happiness, which is nice, and three unrest in the Middle East. And three unrest in the Middle East would mean that it would be sitting here, which means on a four or higher 50-50 shot, there will be an uprising 
in the Middle East, and the Italians can modify that die roll. Now, it'll be down to another die roll to determine whether the British or the French have to unsettle an issue, because um, they both have one. So if no one has more issues than they roll a die, I personally think that it, and there's probably a reason why it's not like this, but personally I think that it should be off of the highest total combined stars. So like, the, the, if the French have Constantinople, it's worth six, and the British have Palestine, which is worth four, for me, I think the French have to go because they have a higher value. But there's probably a reason why it's not like that. So then they're down to a die roll over who has to unsettle an issue. And the uprising might, they might not even have an uprising roll for a few turns, in which case that second military, that second Middle East issue becomes uh, interesting, kind of becomes where no one wants to touch it. So, uh, you know, I think that that's a little bit worse, personally, taking the Zionist state uh, rather than this, uh, because this still pushes it into the three column, which is a six or higher, which is only a six, the six added die. But the, the Italians can modify the die one way or another. So there's still a shot, and they get what they want. This one just really forces the issue. So I think they're still going to do the UK mandate because this is a safer one. And they're going to push that unrest marker up by one. But you see how it can be very, uh, you can manipulate things a lot and really, you know, let a player win something, but really you're not letting a player win something. So they're still going to do this one. Still going to move the Middle East up by one, which, uh, you know, in the future, that Arabia issue has now kind of morphed into something else. So they're going to place this in front of them um, as the UK mandate. They're going to put one of the tokens on it that match the uh, empire thing. So there you go. And they're going to move the Middle East unrest up by one. So next, oh, by the way, I also have done something else a little bit wrong. I forgot back here to uh, flip this. So this actually wouldn't have done anything. Uh, so when you get done, the last thing you do is flip an, a, an event card and you do a crisis um, thing here. It says uprising check. There could not have been an uprising because all of them were in the columns that say no uprisings. So this would not have affected anything, but that's my mistake. I just got ahead of myself. So anyways, the British are now going to do step two of resolving um, or settling an issue, which is this, the Italians get to do this, so let's choose a player. They may either decrease happiness by one or add two unrest to Africa. So um, I think they're gonna choose the, the French. They got bad blood out for the French, the Italian do. And the French don't see the need to reduce a happiness. So they're just going to go over here and add Africa unrest up by two. Because this also kind of protects them in the sense that um, the Africa could possibly have the unrest uh, first. It could be Africa that's having the unrest and not the Middle East. So, you know, an eh, an eh decision by the Italians. Maybe not the best. So now these up here. The British are saying, hey, well, let's get this Middle East issue down here, which makes that one kind of a poison pill that no one really wants to touch. Tyrol to force it. They don't really want to do Tyrol because... Uh, the Americans would just take that, so they don't want to do that one. Balkans, not bad. Uh, but Arabia, in between these two, um, Arabia is interesting because the Americans could just resolve it, but um, then they've thrown their hat in the ring as possibly having the issue unsettled, which nobody really wants to do. Now, we could always let them make that decision, which is kind of interesting. You know, see what they think about it. Or they could just give them uh, the Balkans and be a little less pointed, a little less controversial. Nah. Let's, let's bring down... Uh, let's bring down Arabia. See what happens. Okay. Next, they get to choose which one of these to bring down. So, either add or remove two unrest in the Middle East. Obviously, that one seems pretty interesting. Um, you know, they could bring this down 
And then if they don't get an unrest check, the Americans could resolve Rhineland, then do this, which will could add two more, makes it very likely unrest happens. That issue could come back up. The British could get screwed, but the Americans would actually have interest in that. So I think that this is a, uh, I think this is interesting, because then it gives Ameri the Americans, uh, you know, kind of a, a stake in this that's pretty interesting. Otherwise, they'll have to give the French the Rhineland, which kind of sucks. But maybe they can coax them into doing it one way or another. I don't really see one being better than the other. They'll probably get them to do it as French occupied because that's the uh, the best one. But yeah, I kind of like that. So now we're going to choose a new issue to come up up here. There's nothing to take from the discard pile, so we'll just grab two and examine them. Now this is the British, remember, so we're looking through Lloyd George's perspective. So uh, this one, labor reform, including it as a league issue. Here's your first league issue. Um, by the way, Stefan Pichon is up here, so he can unsettle a league issue, which otherwise is not possible. So they could put this up there with the chance of Pichon coming out and unsettling it. So that's kind of interesting. It's also a four. Um, and it gives everybody a nice little happiness bonus. Or we have inter-allied debt, which uh, makes everyone except the Americans happy, which makes the Americans quite unhappy if they, un if they forgive the debt, whereas if they maintain it, nothing happens. So uh, both of these interesting. This would this one would be good if you were going for something with uh, these industrial icons like mobilization or isolationism. Um, which you know, if I was the if I was Boris Johnson, I would pick isolationism as my strategy card just to uh, add a little bit of humor to this. But since I'm not since I'm not that British Prime Minister, since I'm Lloyd George, I don't think I'm going to pick uh, isolationism. So I'm going to go with uh, labor reform. Uh, also something that probably Boris Johnson won't be doing, but not to say that I do or don't like Boris Johnson. I just think he's a comical guy or not necessarily funny himself, just a funny man. Um, so labor reform is going to go in and we are going to then as the last thing, flip this card and do what it says up here. Each player loses one happiness per deployed military. So it's Keith Murdoch, by the way. And the only person with a deployed military are the Italians. So guess what? They've now lost two um, happiness or whatever. And uh, that does it for the settling. And now it'll go over to the Americans. And I think I might pause it there. I've never done a video all in one cut before. But this is like 45 minutes. It's not a bad length to do, and I'd like to get this up, because I might be one of the first to uh, actually have a video on this up. So, um, I think I could finish out all the way to the Italians, and then it would probably be about an hour. So let's do that. So over to Wilson. And Wilson says, well, we could resolve this, and we could resolve it as independent, which will give us one of those self-determination markers that we like doesn't hurt anybody else. The problem is, is now we have thrown our hat in the ring for this Middle East unrest, which is over here. So we resolve this. We have to resolve this. We're going to have to either add or remove in the Middle East. Now, the Americans can just bail on this entire plot. They can say, hey, let's move the Middle East unrest down, and that way we can keep a hold of Arabia. Because they look at Constantinople and be like, yeah, that's a nice six points, but also everyone wants those six points. It's going to be a bloodbath trying to get it. So why not just cash in? Those three victory points different between the three in Arabia and the six in Constantinople isn't going to be the margin of victory, most likely. So let's just cash in on Arabia. That'll give it over to the French with the Rhineland, though. It's the problem. But the thing is, if they resolve the Rhineland instead of Arabia, then they're in the same situation. What they could do instead is place their own cubes on the Rhineland, fight for that, and once again, the Italians and the British don't want to touch this because they're trying to get the con trying to get Constantinople out. The Americans aren't entirely aware of that. Um, they're a little bit aware because I'm sure it's been discussed between the two, but they're also not pointedly aware. 
So fighting for the Rhineland is interesting. Um, and then they could drop another one up on labor reform or on that Balkans issue. So kind of tough. They have the cubes. They already have six out, which is more than anyone was tied with the French. So they don't want to get too deeply invested. But they also just don't want to let the French have that easy. Because then it's not three to six. It's If they take this one, it's not three to six. It's three to 12, which is a bit much. Um, but also when unrest happens, they want to choose first so they can get that 14 points. Yeah, that's what they're going to do. They're going to place three on the Rhineland. And then they're going to place one up here on labor reform. And they're not going to do anything else as far as military goes. Now for the French, they uh, see that they're in a precarious situation here. They want the Rhineland. But they might leave it for the Americans if they resolve it as uh, French occupied, maybe. Because um, they could add two more to get four. And then add another one somewhere else. Not an easy decision here. Or they could, uh, I think is more interesting, they resolve Arabia. Um, or settle Arabia. I doubt the French will take it as a French mandate. Um, I doubt the Americans will resolve it that way. Because they don't particularly want it resolved as that. They would just leave it. Um, but they could let the Americans resolve it as independent. And then slide down something else. But the problem is, then you might give them Arabia and the Rhineland. But that does, that does make it a little bit harder for you to roll in as Constantinople. So you might be able to keep that six. I think that's what they're gonna do. They're gonna settle the Arabia issue. Once again, there's all these kinds of intricacies that you know make this very interesting. So they're going to settle Arabia. So the winner loses all of theirs to the exhausted. The British will, anyone else loses half as long as they're not the person who re is settling it. So one goes to the exhausted, one goes back to their general supply. Now the um, winner will resolve it, and the Americans are going to resolve it as independent, which I do not believe happened historically. So they're going to take one of these self-determination markers and drop it down on the card, which is in front of them. So they have three points and a possible victory point should they choose a strategy card that matches that. Now the French will have this card to decide from, which says either add or remove to unrest in the Middle East, and they don't particularly want to have unrest, so they're going to bump it down. They can't bump it down by two because this power keg is there, which means the maximum it can go is this column. So they're going to move it back one. So now this, this plot by the Italians and the British has backfired because the French have managed to wiggle their way in, and the, the Americans didn't really help out, but... Uh, it was on a solid front against the French. There also wasn't really a reason to have one. So now they get to decide between these three issues which one is going to come down. Um, they could bring down Tyrol, which you know kind of gives the Italians something to do, or labor reform, which makes them a little happier. They don't particularly like any of these, honestly. None of these are sticking out to them. This one's just worth the most, but it's also going to be probably fought over the most. So I'm thinking that they're going to do something. I think they're going to bring that anyways and give themselves a break. Maybe the Americans will focus on this and they won't be focusing on the Rhineland. Kind of divide up the decisions that the Americans have to make. And uh, that way they can... Maybe take the Rhineland. Then they have to pick one of these to go down. They get unsettled the league issue. Or optionally add unrest to the Pacific. So they're going to knock this one down. Because it's kind of an eh. And then they can choose either this to go here. Or one of these. 
And this actually looks kind of nice because these indu industrial um, markers, which they're thinking about going for, and it also makes everybody a little happier. So I'm thinking that they're going to pick this one up and drop it in the inter-allied debt, which is a European issue. They kind of like it. Lastly, we are going to flip this card, which is uh, Bela Kuhn, who was a Hungarian communist. And we're going to do an uprising check, which we actually will make one. So on the back of this little turn option thing is, boom, uprising check. So the only, there's only one place we can do that. We have to do it where there's the most unrest. This is actually the perfect place to end it, right after this. So uh, it's going to be Africa. And there's going to be no modifiers. If the Italians had troops there, then they could uh, modify the die, but there's nobody there. So it's going to be straight up a die roll. If it's a six, then there is an uprising. If it's anything besides a six, then there is not an uprising. And we just move on. And it's literally a six. So that's pretty funny. Now, I will say that it doesn't really matter because there's been no Africa issues resolved. So if there's no issues, as far as I understand, there uh, won't be um, an uprising. But uh, let me double check that really quick because that can depend on whether or not we pick strategy cards. Yeah, so there's actually a special note in the rule book that even if there is, this was a successful uprising, it's just there wasn't um, any issues to unsettle. So they actually will do their strategy things, which this is way earlier than the last game I played. As you can see, there's only been three settled issues. When I played, each side had at least three. So this is much earlier than last time, which is, uh, which is not a bad thing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go from the person who has the least amount of victory points to the person who has the most and determine who gets what. So the Italians have none, the Americans have three, the British have four, and the French have six. So it's going to go in that order pretty easy. So looking at this, the Italians haven't gotten anything yet. Um, they haven't settled anything. So they don't have one thing particularly that they're going for yet. So they can do whatever. Um, mobilization is kind of cool. Um, it doesn't really match up with what they're going for thus far. Um, but it gives them... These are, these are quite frequent, these... Uh, German reparations, these industrial markers are around quite a bit. Um, this, uh, these are good for the Italians, obviously, and the military. So they kind of like that one. That means they wouldn't be against signing the treaty. They could be for signing the treaty, um, but they don't love this one. This one I think is going to be hard because uh, keeping unrest low, so they don't really want to tie themselves to that. I'm going to go with mobilization. So the Italians are going to slide on mobilization. It says, Germans are unhappy with the peace process, and the armistice is breaking down. Strategy is to use military posture to dampen down German intransience. So now it's going to be the Americans to choose next. Easy choice. They're going to go with the 14 points. They like this one. It's historical. Easy choice. League issues are very important. Giving the Italians and the Japanese design is very important. And uh, self-determination is important, which they already have a self-determination they've won. British next. And they kind of like this one. And they don't like this one. This one is kind of eh. The happiness bonus is nice. Mm. This one they have to keep their... Uh, military up in order to get some good points. They're going to go with revanchism, which says aggressive policies expand and recover lost territory, position held by British and Italians along the Balkan coast. So that's historical as well. They're going to go with that one. And the French, between outlawing war and isolationism, this one's definitely possible. And some good points could be won off of it. But they're going to go with isolationism. Try and bump up that, uh, try and bump up that uh, happiness, keep the happiness high. And they also don't want the Italians and the Japanese to sign the treaty, which makes it interesting. It says pull back on focus, pull back to focus on domestic agendas. So that's, uh, that's going to make things interesting there, which is also a good place 
for this video to stop. So that's uh, two rounds, I think, and quite a lot has already happened, all in one and a half takes, really. So I'm um, going to talk for like an hour, pretty much. So uh, hope you all enjoyed. This will be episode one, and we'll keep on carrying on like we've been doing with this um, next time, and we'll be starting off this really cool active player marker very cool and that's going to be for the Italians the only player without any settled issues thanks for watching hope you enjoyed